contains information relating to the PRD-800 and the PRD-900. It is very important that you follow the standard safety procedures when working on satellite receivers. Please read notes 1, 2 and 3 on page 3 of the service manual. You'll need the following test equipment, a digital voltmeter and an oscilloscope. And if you have access to a frequency counter, you will also find this useful. First we'll start with the switch mode power supply. The 240 volt main supply is fed through T1 and this transformer working with C1 forms a filter to minimize the feedback of RFI into the mains. It is then rectified by D1, 2, 3 and 4 and smoothed by C2. R2 supplies a start up voltage to C6 and this capacitor holds it long enough for U1 to reach its operating frequency. If you connect to a oscilloscope to the junction of R2 and pin 6 of U1. Plug into the mains, you will observe C6 charging repeatedly. This is due to the feedback loop missing from pin 11 of T2. Now switch off by removing the mains plug and you will see the DC level drop. The feedback voltage from pin 11 of T2 is fed to D8 to be rectified and then through R15 and on to pin 6 of U1. This is D8 and this R15. Now with the feedback circuit reconnected, connect your oscilloscope to the junction of R2 and pin 6 U1, plug into the main supply and observe C6 charging. At the peak the feedback voltage holds the power supply on. R13 and C4 set the frequency for the switch mode. This must be between 25 and 30 kilohertz. This can be seen with a frequency counter on pin 1 of U1. As you can see, 27 kilohertz. If you haven't got a frequency counter, obviously you can check this with an oscilloscope. The feedback loop also supplies regulation via D9 and R16. A voltage of 2.4 at pin 8 of U1 is set by R10, 11 and 12, but only when all the output voltages on the secondary side of T2 are correct. Q1 is a switching transistor and this is driven from U1 out of pin 5. A negative voltage is generated across D11 and this is used to switch Q1 off. Resistors 4, 5, diodes 5 and 6 and capacitor 3 are a snubber network to dissipate excess energy from Q1. Overcurrent protection is implemented by R8 and R14. There are four outputs from T2 secondary, 5 volts, 14 volts, 18 and 27 volts. The 27 volt line can be tested at the cathode of D2. Plug into the mains and check your voltage and there you will see around 25 to 30 volts. The 5 volt line comes from pins 10 and 12 of T2 via D13 and L1. So look for 5 volts on L1. Pins 8 and 12 supply via D14 around 14 volts into regulator 1. This is a 12 volt regulator, so check on the cathode of D14 for 14 to 15 volts, and then on the input side of reg 1 
for around 14 volts. If this is OK, you should then check the output side of rig 1 for 12 volts. The emitter of Q3 is connected to the 12 volt line and the base via U3 connects to the microprocessor U2 at pin 10. So by closing the operate switch you are sending a signal to pin 12 of U2 and this is decoded and a signal is output from pin 10 into pin 2 of U3 and then out of pin 15 to eventually arrive on the base of Q3. This then biases the transistor on and supplies a standby 5 volt line to the UHF modulator. So now connect your voltmeter to pin 10 of U2, switch on, and you should see around 5 volts on the output. Just to confirm, switch off, and switch on again, and this of course is then fed into pin 2 of U3. So to check through, go on to pin 2, and switch on confirm the voltage is arriving and off. Now pin 15 in the off position should be high. If you've got 15 volts, switch on and you should drop to around half a volt. Switch off, 15 volts, switch on, 0.7. Now at the junction of R23 and R22, this is off, and this is on. Now onto the base of Q3, this is off, and this is on. And this is the emitter, which is the input side of the transistor. Collector, 14 volts out to supply the 5 volt line, and the 5 volt line is held down by a Zener diode D78. There are two supplies left out of T2 a 14 volt line and a 12 volt line. This is used to alter the polarity of the LMB. The 14 volt line from D14 and the 12 volt line from D15. Q2 is switched on or off from U2 via U3. To test this, find a transmission with horizontal polarization with a vertical transmission next to it. When you change channels, the bias is altered on the base of Q2. So check with your digital voltmeter on the output of pin 28 of the processor and then on pin 16 of U3. Now check the base of Q2 and on the output side, on the end of L3, this is the voltage that the LMB will be receiving. Now go back to the microprocessor, pin 26, and change channels, and you'll see you've gone from a low to a high. And then on pin 16 of U3, this has also reversed, and on the base, we should find a voltage of around 18.3 and then the output from L3 is at 19 volts. So now by changing channels you can test to see that the switching is working correctly.
lines, obviously, all the lines that you've just checked out. Remote-controlled data is received from the infrared sensor into pin 5 of U2 and data output from pin 36 into pin 15 of U9. This can be checked with your oscilloscope by connecting to pin 15 of U9 with the scope set to DC. Send a signal via the handset and you can see the data information flashing across the bottom of the oscilloscope tube. This data is sent to the frequency synthesizer within U9. The tuning voltage is output from pin 16 of U9 into pin 15 of MOD1, the tuner. By placing your voltmeter on pin 15 of the tuner and changing channels you can observe a voltage change depending upon what channel you're looking at. Or if you prefer, you can go into menu and do a sweep tune and then watch the voltage go up and down accordingly. As I explained earlier, the frequency synthesis is performed by U9, which receives divider ratio data from the required program from U2. The synthesizer generates a reference frequency from the 4 MHz clock input on pin 12 of U9. And again, you can check this with your frequency counter or oscilloscope. First check on pin 2 of the main microprocessor, U2, and then on U9. The pre scoured input on pin 18 of U9 is divided down according to the divider ratio data and compared with the generated reference, the error signal being used to generate the tuner control voltage. And this is via Q15, appears on pin 15 of the tuner, MOD1. What you're looking at now is the prescaler input to pin 18 of U9. As you change channels, you'll see the frequency changing, and also the amplitude will vary. Now you can check the tuning voltage on pin 15 tuner which is fed from pin 16 of U9 via Q15. So by placing your voltmeter on pin 15 and changing channels you should see the voltage alter. The PRD900 is a dual LMB input receiver. LMB1 is selected via Q17 on pin 6 of the tuner. LMB2 is collected via Q16 which feeds into pin 4 of the tuner. And these two controls are operated obviously by U2, the microprocessor, via IC U5. Although you can select between 1 and 2 LMBs, they must remain in the same polarity. You can't have LMB1 going in a vertical polarity and LMB2 in a horizontal polarity at the same time. In order to check the switching of the LMBs and their respective polarities, it's a good idea to set up a little test program with the handset. So if you go to, let's say, channel 20, then press
WordPress menu and then buttons 5, 1 and 4 then press the left or the right hand arrow button and you'll see L and B will change from 1 to 2 and press store twice then move up to channel 22 in the same procedure press menu and then 5, 1 and 4 and again the left or the right hand arrow button to move up to L and B2 and store twice now move up to channel 24 and follow exactly the same procedure and after you've pressed the arrow button to change the LMB don't press store, go to 2 and then press the arrow button again and you'll see the polarity change from horizontal to vertical and then press store twice So what you've done is you set channel 20 to LMB2, horizontal polarization, 20 bombers left alone on LMB1, horizontal, 22 is on 2, horizontal, 23 again was left alone, and 24 was set to LMB2 but with vertical polarization. What you must remember though that LMB1 at this point will also be in vertical polarization. Now you can check that the microprocessor is sending out the right signals to the LMB switching by checking on pin 11 or view 5 and as you can see by changing channels you will either go high or low. Low is for LMB1, high is for LMB2. So this is quite a useful little exercise to do just to check the switching is working correctly. And if you continue to press on up through the channels, you'll see that it's remaining on a low, so these are all set for LMB1. Remember that Q17 and 16 uh, enabled the tuner to select either one or two LMB, so if you look at the collectors of these transistors, one will be high and the other will be low. So you then change channels to change LMBs, the reverse happens. And you can also check this on pins 4 and pin 6 of the tuner. So this will confirm that the tuner is receiving the correct switching signals. So just to recap, the signal through Q17 into pin 6 is LMB1 and from Q16 is LMB2. Selection for the power is also done from pin 4 of the tuner through Q58 follow the line up through the resistor network onto the base of Q60. Power from the power supply comes in via the emitter of Q60 and you should now check voltages on this particular transistor on the base you'd expect to see 17.4 and then on the emitter 18.2 on the collector 18.2 and this is with LMB2 switched on. Q61 is a transistor which supplies power to LMB1 so you would expect to see around 18 volts on the basin emitter 0 volts on its collector. So now go back to the collector of Q60 and change channels so that you change the LMBs over. And you should see the voltage drop if you now go to the collector of Q61, which is the power switch for LMB1, you should see it come up to 18 volts. And then by pressing another channel again or going back, you reverse. Now you remember we set the last channel for vertical polarization, which introduces the 12 volt line instead of the 18 volt line. As you can see, now you're switching 12 volts rather than 18 volts. The baseband output from pin 13 of the tuner goes in three different directions. One into the video amplifier, coupled by a Q100, and a 
again through Q100 to the audio section and then the last one through Q100 into the baseband amplifier So the output from the tuner goes through Q100, as we showed you before, to arrive at Q106 and 109 to form a two-stage amplifier which is buffered to pin 19 of the decoder connector SK5. The buffered output goes through an emitter follower Q110 and drives an output impedance of 75 ohms. These are some of the waveforms you'd expect to see on Q106 on the base, about 70 millivolts on the collector about 650 millivolts and then on Q109 base 650 millivolts and on the collector about 2.5 volts and on Q110 on the base 2.5 and on the collector Now we can check with the meter. First Q106 on the base, 0.57 on the collector, 5.2 on the base of Q109, 2.4 and on the collector, 5.5. Finally Q110 base. 5.5 and on the collector 4.8 the emitter of Q106 109 and 110 Mac and PAL transmissions have a different pre-emphasis when transmitted from a satellite the power Mac baseband selection switches between the different de-emphasis curves. This is done under the control of U2 from pin 24 of U9. Place your voltmeter on pin 24 of U9 and change between a Mac and a PAL transmission. And you can check to see that the switching voltage is working correctly. Now go to the collector of Q108 and switch again and you should see the voltage go from 0 0.61 to about 1.22 volts. If power is selected the response of the amplifier is modified by the power de-emphasis circuit R148266C112 and 113. If MAC is selected the power response of the amplifier is modified by C116 and R563 to give MAC de-emphasis and then as explained earlier on once the signal has been processed by Q109 and Q110 it goes to pin 19 of SK5 The baseband output from the tuner enters the preamp in U9 via pin 3. The gain of the preamp is set by R134 and R135. After leaving the preamp at pin 2 it re-enters at pin 4 and is amplified before exiting again on pin 6. The output from pin 2 is inverted and de-emphasized by R145, 149 and C114 and now as I explained earlier it re-enters on pin 4 and exits as an inverted signal on pin 6 
you've seen the video signal XTIN U9 at pin 6, where this now becomes one of two possible video input sources. This now enters pin 7 into the video selection switch. The other possible source is from pin 20 of SK5 and enters the chip at pin 8. After selection it leaves the chip at pin 10 and re-enters again at pin 23. So this is the video signal now going in on pin 7. And exit in on pin 10. The selected video source then re-enters at pin 23 to a contrast variable amplifier which is controllable from U2, the microprocessor, and then exits on pin 20 to be filtered. This is the video signal XT U9 for the final time. If you find that you have problems with this chip working with your oscilloscope set to DC, press a button on the handset and check that you have chip enable pulses on pin 11. And also you should check for data on pin 15 and for clock pulses on pin 19. The best way to check these is to hold one of the arrow buttons down, so you're getting a constant flow of data. After the video signal leaves U9 for the final time, it has to be filtered. And this is done by a low-pass filter comprising of L10, L11 and C103, C106. These components have a cutoff point of 5.5 MHz. And here you can see L11 and L10. Phase compensation is provided by Q31. Here now are some of the DC voltages you would expect to see on Q31. First on the emitter, around about 2.1 volts. On the collector, 9.9. .9. And finally on the base, around about 2.79. Once filtered and phase compensated, the video signal passes on to an amplifier and sound trap. This is Q18 and Q19. This is to remove any residual audio subcarriers. And these are the video waveforms that you can expect to see passing through these two transistors. Satellite transmissions are transmitted with energy dispersal to distribute the energy evenly across the bandwidth. This is a 25 Hz triangular waveform added to the signal. If this waveform is not removed, you will see a flicker on the picture. The video signal is AC coupled via buffer Q20 and then clamped to a fixed level during the color burst period by Q92, and this then clamps the signal to a fixed voltage. 
Calabas gate pulses are sent from pin 12 of U18. The fixed voltages are determined by R171, 172, Q22 and D44 which can be found by pin 7 of U20. Now let's look at some waveforms. This is Q20 base video waveform. Now emitter output. And now the DC levels. You would expect to see around 2.4 on the base and around 3 volts on the emitter. Now look at pin 12 of U18. This is the color burst gate pulses output into Q92 via U19C. First look at the waveform on pin 12 of U18. This is the color burst gate pulses. This is where you'll find Q92. There you see the input for the color burst gate pulses and then the clamped video signal. Finally in this section the DC voltages on Q22. You would expect to see about 3.1 volts on the base and the emitter 2.49 and the collector 3.78. video signal passes through the sync separators of which there are two. The first is made up from D38, Q24, R179 and 180 and Q25. This is the signal path you must follow through the first separator. A composite video signal is generated from this separator and fed from the collector of Q25 to the graphics generator U10 on pin 30. The second separator is U18. The video signal is fed from the emitter of Q23 into pin 19. Let's look at the waveforms on Q24. First the base this is the clamped video signal. Now the collector output going to the base of Q25. And now Q25 base and the inverted signal on the collector. Now the DC levels to be checked with a meter. First Q24 base this should be around 4.3 volts. Now the emitter again roughly 4.3 volts and the collector 0.4 and now on the base of Q25 around 0 0.085 on the emitter 0 and the collector 4.8 From the base of Q25 the inverted signal out of the collector is fed into pin 30 of the graphics chip, IC10. This is the waveform that you would expect to see. U18 is the second sync separator and with its associated components generates vertical sync pulses from pin 13 
and from pin 15 color bearscape pulses. This is the video signal fed from the emitter of Q23 on pin 19 of U18. As you can see the signal is fed via C301. Vertical sync pulses are output from pin 15 and color burst is output from pin 12. D69 converts these pulses from 12 to 5 volts. As I mentioned earlier, I fed to the base of Q92 and used for the energy dispersal and also video crypt timing. There's base of Q92. And as you can see, they are fed via U19C. Station ID information is also output from pin 7. This can be seen by changing channels. This is used to switch in coloured backgrounds in the absence of a video signal. This is the graphics generator I see, and this is used to generate colored backgrounds and text for the menus. This is under the control of the main micro U2. There are two oscillators for U10. The first is this crystal, circuit reference X2. This generates a frequency of 17.7344 MHz. U10 holds the second oscillator, and its 7 MHz frequency is set by L12, C120, and C119. Used with horizontal and vertical sync pulses which are generated within U10, generate the character positions on the screen. With a frequency counter you can see on pin 29 the oscillator frequency of 17.7344 and this is four times the frequency of the color information used for the backgrounds. This frequency must be within 300 Hz. On pin 4 you can see 7 megs. For superimposed mode the generation of sync pulses is from the composite sync signal from the collector of Q25 into pin 30. In plain background mode this composite sync is not required for pulse generation. You can see with your scope on pin 30 the sync pulses. Black and white levels are generated by a full white Rs 153 and 154 and input on pin 15. You can see this on your scope. By pressing the menu button on the handset you will see the white portion of the graphics information. RS 155 and 156 generate the black levels and they are input to pin 14. This black level can be seen with the oscilloscope using the handset as before. Connect your oscilloscope to pin 19 without the LNB connected. Observe the waveform. This signal is amplitude 2. 
If you look at a TV monitor, you will see a coloured raster. Now connect the LMB and see the signal disappear as the video information is received. And again with the LMB disconnected. Now go to pin 20 and observe the waveform. This is amplitude 1. Again, if the LMB is removed, the same effect is seen. We'll now look at the DC levels with the voltmeter. Pin 19 with video information is zero, and without 1.7 volts. Pin 20 with video information again zero, without 2.2 volts. Pin 16, level 2, should be around 2.2 volts. And pin 15, white level, around 2.7. Pin 18, which is the plus 5 volt line, should obviously read around 5 volts. And also, this is found on pin 32. And finally, on pin 9, which is level 1, you should see around 1.9 volts. The baseband signal is fed from the emitter of Q100 via C156 to pin 24 of U11. This can be seen with your oscilloscope. The desired audio subcarriers are selected by being mixed with a frequency synthesized oscillator to frequencies of 10.52 MHz and 10.7 MHz. The oscillator's mixer frequency is controlled by L14. C146 D39 plus control voltages from pins 2 and 3 of U11. This is where you'll find L14 and here are C146 and D39. By using the handset select the audio menu by pressing menu then number 5 and number 2. Now press the right hand arrow button and you will observe stereo A going up to stereo D and then 101. At the same time the subcarrier frequencies will be changing. Now press number 2. With your scope set to DC, connect it to pin 3 of U11. Press and hold down the right hand arrow button and you will see the frequencies start to count up. If you now look at your oscilloscope you will see the trace very slowly move up. This is the control voltage. U11 
has two IF outputs on pins 21 and 22. Pin 22 drives filters X3 and X4, both at 10.52 MHz, and this frequency is fed back into U11 at pin 17. Pin 21 drives X5 and X6, both of these are 10.7 MHz, which are fed back into pin 15, where both frequencies are demodulated. The FM discriminator slopes are factory tuned by L15 and L16 to set the DC bias of approximately 2.5 volts at the outputs. You can check the frequencies with a counter. On pin 13 you can see 10.69 MHz and on pin 10 you should see 10.51 MHz. Also check the oscillator on pin 1. This must be 4 MHz. The audio outputs are right pin 11 and this is set by L15 and left pin 14 set by L16. With an AC voltmeter check the DC bias on pin 11 and 14. As we are now working in stereo we will continue to run down the left hand channel as this has one extra section. In this section we will be dealing with two ICs, U14 and U16. The audio outputs from U11 go into U14A pin 3 for right hand channel and U14B pin 10 for left hand channel. U14C is configured as a non-inverting amplifier with a gain of 7. The signal is then passed to two low-pass filters connected in series U14 and U16D. The filters have their 3 dB points set at 50 kHz and 8 kHz. The combined response of the filters gives a cutoff frequency of 15 kHz with an attenuation slope of 24 dB per octave. This is the input on pin 10 of U14 from pin 14 of U11 and the output on pin 8. It then re-enters 14 on pin 12 and finally leaves U14 on pin 14. It then enters U16 on pin 12 to exit on pin 14. Confirm that on pin 4, on both U14 and U16, that there is a 12 volt supply. stereo channels are fed via the panda noise reduction circuitry to the de-emphasis circuit, but a mono channel can have 50 microsecond de-emphasis, however only mono 1 is preset to this. The mono channel is de-emphasized by U15 and passed directly to U17, the audio source selection switch. You can trace this signal path with your oscilloscope. First go to U15. Connect your oscilloscope to pin 5 and you will observe the audio input. The output from the chip is on pin 7. The signal then goes off to U17 and the mono inputs are on pins 4 and 11 and the outputs 
are on pins 3 and 13. The PAND system is used by Astra for its narrowband FM subcarriers to give superior dynamic range and signal to noise performance. The signal is compressed according to its level and frequency. Therefore, for an FM system, a smaller bandwidth is required. This introduces less noise, therefore more subcarriers can fit into a given channel. At the receiver, the signal is correspondingly expanded to reproduce the original signal. This is achieved by using a dual compander, U13A. Fed from U16A, which has a converter and has its input biased at mid rail to allow full swing on the output. Next to the expander, the input signal is fed to a variable gain cell and rectifier. The output of the rectifier controls the gain so that the output is proportional to the average of value of the input signal. U16B converts the current from the gain cell within U13 to a voltage, which is then fed through a low-pass filter, U16C. This removes the high-frequency content of the signal. Then de this by U15C. The output from this IC is then fed to pin 3 of SK5 and the audio source selection switch. Now we trace with the scope. First on U16, the input on pin 2, output on pin one, then down to U13, the input on pin 9 and pin 13, and then the outputs on pin 10 and 11. Now back up to U16, to pin 5, Pin 6, which are inputs. And coming out on pin 7, back in on pin 9, and finally coming out. Pin 8, where it then goes to U15, pin 10, and pin 9. And the output from pin 8 goes out to U17 and inputs on pins 12 and 14, and the output is on pin 13. Bearing in mind this is just the left hand channel. This is all duplicated for the right hand side with the exception of the mono section. And finally just confirm you've got HT 12 volts on pin 16 U15 and on pin 4 or 16 and again pin 4 Well that concludes the service training for the PRD series of satellite receivers. I hope this has been of some use to you. If you have any comments, I'm sure that we'd be more than happy to hear from you, any suggestions. And please look out for further training videos on base systems. There's quite a few in the pipeline, so keep your eyes open and hopefully you'll enjoy watching the next one.